Welcome to Coffee and Regs, a CSS RegTech podcast series on moving from a tactical to strategic approach to regulatory compliance. Hi, this is Natalie Silverman for CSS. Welcome to our next episode of Coffee and Regs. On today's episode, we have a special guest and former parliamentarian to give us the latest on ESG, Level 2 SFDR, and what investment managers need to be thinking about to prepare for 2022 implementation. Please welcome the Authority on Global Financial Services Legislation and Vice Chair of Financial Services at KPMG UK, Dr. Kay Swinburne, and CSS's Chief Product Officer, Ronan Brennan. Good morning, Ronan and Kay, and thanks for sitting down for Coffee and Regs. Thanks for joining me today on all things ESG and SFDR. Before we kick off, you'd like to introduce yourself. Thanks, Ronan. So I'm Kay Swinburne, and I'm the Vice Chair of Financial Services at KPMG. But before that, many of you might have come across me during my 10-year stint as a European parliamentarian dealing on the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee and many of the regulations, including the sustainable finance package that we are no doubt we'll touch on today with the taxonomy and SFDR, actually were packages I worked on when I was an elected member. So some familiarity there. Fantastic. So it'll be difficult to find someone more qualified to speak about you know, the challenges on the European side of the fence, as well as developments in the UK, maybe as they relate to the TCFD. So maybe given that, could you offer us a, a kind of maybe a state of affairs, like where we are with the latest regulatory situation in Europe and in the UK? Absolutely. And I think the one thing to bear in mind with the ESG regulatory sort of front is that it's constantly evolving. Probably one of the few pieces of legislation I've ever worked on where it's deliberately set for an evolution, that it's never going to be static, that we'll always be trying to actually amend it as and when we know more information and as disclosures are made. So when, you know, whether it's the banks through their stress tests or the asset managers through SFDR and the disclosures of their funds, portfolio content on the ESG, whatever it is, that information is going to lead to the next sort of level of regulation. So mm. it's constantly going to evolve. And so, you know, one of the big things I need to, to warn everybody in this space is that this is never going to be static. It's always going to be a moving feast. And you therefore need to be ready to actually change your systems at any point in time to cope with that. But in particular, you know, the UK led with the TCFD work and the stress testing of banks and insurers. The EU is catching up pretty rapidly through the EBA and the ECB's work. Mm -hmm. And so those disclosures will be worked on. So once the information is there, the central banks, whether they be in the UK or in the EU, no doubt will do something with them. And in particular, I think the EU very quickly will actually make changes to its capital and solvency rules. And, you know, the UK may follow suit, I suspect, a little slower behind because they're not so minded to intervene without a global steer from the Basel Committee. So I think, you know, we are going to see changes there on things like SFDR, of course, the EU is going ahead on its own. The UK has decided not to do that for its current fund structures. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that most of those fund managers who are based in London are subject to these anyway. And so they're doing them for that EU regulatory framework. But if you think of SFDR and the way that that's evolving and transforming the disclosures, there are more amendments coming. So if you actually think about the amendments that are coming to Solvency 2, to mm. the IDD, to MIFID, USITS, AFMD, they're all going to actually be changed to require sustainability to be factored into the investment processes and indeed into the investment risk management and product governance and then the suitability assessments for all clients. So there's a lot of work ongoing, and that's without talking about the green bonds and the standards that they're developing, and indeed the taxonomy for the social impact element of this. We've only so far got the E, not the S from Europe. So there's yeah. a lot going on. And, you know, they're also making calls for ESG ratings agencies, for example, to be regulated going forward. So this is not something that we can say we've done and dusted once we implement the current regulation. There's going to be a continuous stream of changes afoot. As I'm engaging with a lot of different folk in the markets, there's a lot of concern around probably more so the taxonomy, I, I guess, because there's certain dates coming up in January where things become a little bit hotter at that point in time. But the lack of clarity from the ESAs with respect to how the taxonomy and SFDO will technically align at different points. 
And I guess also the market's readiness to respond to that, not just the investment manufacturers and distributors and producers of products, but also the vendor community and their ability to to produce the data needed to, to do the analytics. Is that something you've seen yourself or would you agree that that tends to be one of the larger problems facing the industry right now? So I think many who have had to tackle the first round of disclosures under SFDR, and they are doing it fairly blind because the RTSs are obviously delayed. When they're actually doing their first round, what they're seeing is that the quality of data is a real issue. So what is the data that they're receiving it? Where does it come from? Who has done any work on it? And and how is it actually being cleaned up? And then if they're relying on external entities, then that's a problem in itself because you don't know what's happened to that data in terms of, you know, any changes, any tweaks or any standardization calibration that's been done. Mm -hmm. So that really is, is something that is, I guess, worrying my clients right now. But, you know, we are seeing a big move, I guess, by the commission through the RTSs to try and standardize some of this. You know, we're seeing things related to the PRIP kit, where the document is length constrained. So it's very difficult to get that information in there. And, you know, in some cases, even the fact that it's in different languages is going to mean that you're going to be really constrained by that word length of a document as to how much disclosure you can make to the end consumer. So there are lots of nitty gritty that need to be worked through in all of this. And our clients haven't been given the guidance that they would normally have. The EU is normally quite prescriptive. And in this instance, it has gone ahead with an implementation date for SFDR before the RTSs are all known and published. And therefore, the detailed guidelines on how they should implement are not there to guide them. So it's an unusual situation, but they are making the best of it. And in fact, for me, we are knowing that most of the firms in this space are trying to do the right thing. And I don't think any of them will be penalized for trying to do the right thing. It's yeah. only if they're trying to disguise it that they'll get into trouble. Although that being said, I've seen or observed some of the continental European NCAs certainly have definitely done a broad audit of the level one application by some firms in their jurisdiction and have come out with quite a negative viewpoint on and certainly a segment of of that implementation, which I thought was a bit a bit rich given the lack of the level two, but I guess that's that's where we are. It's the world we're in right now. It's we, we're kind of working around a bit in the dark. And the interesting thing, Ronan, is that each member state's national competent authority yeah. has added some extra rules of their own. Right. And so you're seeing them being a little more prescriptive and a little more demanding in certain countries than in others. And so the whole idea of having an EU framework is you're supposed to actually harmonize all of this rather than having individual NCAs doing things differently. But it is being seen in some respects as being a competitive advantage for certain countries to go further and harder in this space and to make sure there's no greenwashing in their constituency. So I think we are going to see a little while before this is going to settle down. Yeah, so I've certainly seen the French have have layered in a, a layer of regulation on top of SFDR, where it kind of sits kind of parallel to it. And obviously, I guess many would see the UK's adoption of TCFD as being kind of a fairly astute move in the sense that it probably does. There's an aspect of it that definitely provides a competitive advantage, although I think, as you've pointed out, Larger European firms distributing in the UK, they're going to have to be aware of that and be cognizant of how to respond to it. And likewise, UK firms who are distributing into Europe across the border will also have to be aware of the SFDR side of things. So it's kind of, a, I guess it's a two-way street for the larger firms. Yeah, The TCFD does seem to have greater international resonance beyond Europe, certainly. But I think, Ronan, I'd, I'd go so far as to say that the, the UK at the moment through the SCA's work mm. and the TCFD recommendations that now have to be applied in a comply or explain manner. The TCFD in the UK is currently focused on climate change. And so that reporting requirement for premium listed companies is very definitely about climate and not the broader environmental objectives. And there is a big debate going on in the UK right now, whether the reporting under TCFD should cover all six environmental objectives, not just climate change. So even within the UK, there's likely to be further work going on and, and you know, the, the goalposts moving continuously. And indeed, you know, the widening of that corporate requirement is expected to capture many, many more firms, not just those premium listed firms in the very near term. And so, you know, there are changes afoot there too. 
And indeed, the EU has introduced its corporate reporting for large listed and yeah. pies, the public interest entities. But they're also going to put in place the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, yeah. another piece of work, which is a very broad brush piece that will actually in time capture all listed firms and in many instances, unlisted companies of size. So I think, you know, we've got a lot coming ahead of us, but these types of reporting regulations and, and requirements will improve the quality of the data, hopefully, from the corporates to the asset managers and to the banks. And so I'm very hopeful that in the round, these will be very additive and will be complementary and assist one another so that that quality of data goes up so that you're actually reporting good information over time and much better caliber and quality. Yeah, and I'd echo that. And I've heard it firsthand from numerous vendors, you know, what I would call the, the ESG specialist and, and rating specific vendors in the marketplace. I'm very hopeful that the new corporate reporting structures will deliver a lot more consistent information. And we know that the US administration is observing this and have their own plans to, to implement something quite similar in the United States. Maybe to wrap up, one key thing I know a lot of folks that have tuned in today are going to be interested to hear are your thoughts on the SFDR dates, the effective compliance date for level two, and whether we see the July 1, 2022 date potentially moving or not. We know that IFAMA are lobbying intensely in the background, and we know that they are, they're finding receptive ears, but to what extent might we expect a decision or not on a delay? So... I found it unusual that the EU, before the RTSs were all published, decided to actually go ahead with the original implementation date. Mm. It's very unusual for them to do things in that way, but they were determined to do so, and mainly because of the political pressure, mm. because they see that climate change can't wait, yeah. and therefore you have to get on with at least the best efforts, mm. even if the detail isn't all worked out yet. And I think that that, that is going to be maintained I genuinely think that the pressure of COP26 and you know all of the, the public declarations that countries around the globe are going to make, the momentum that will be building in the year following as they try and get all of those countries to commit to various new targets, I think we're not going to see a reducing of that pressure. So I think we will go ahead with that date. But do you know what, Ronan, I've learned to say, never say never in politics. Yeah, we all said the same about the March 10th date and, and, and many of us were caught out, uh, including myself. And yeah, what I've heard as well is that, you know, if any date's going to move, it'll be the PRIPS date. And, and yeah, you just when you think about all the documentation that's going to have to be updated and the public web and the analytics and data that has to be gathered and marshaled together, it's just it's, it's a phenomenal amount of work. Any parting thoughts before we sign off for today? So my only parting thoughts are to, to link what you said about the US and the fact that they've now come into the tent to negotiate. I am really hopeful that we're going to have some minimum global standards through the new International Sustainability Standards Board. Yeah. And so for me, having that global coherence is going to make a lot of sense. So rather than just having all of these different disclosures in different regions, you start to have a thread, hopefully, yeah. in that global standards board that starts to pull this together so that we can make sense, not just for local companies, yeah. but what their global footprints are. So I think that will make it easier for those financial services intermediaries to really deal with the global investments that they have. Thanks, Kay and Ronan, for the insight into how you like your regs in the morning. For CSS, this is Natalie Silverman. This has been another episode of Coffee and Regs, a CSS RegTech podcast series. Make sure you catch every episode by subscribing to our podcast on www.cssregtech.com or through your podcast platform of choice. Thanks so much for tuning in. This podcast is brought to you by Compliance Solutions Strategies and is for general information purposes only. All rights reserved.